Hello, everybody, and welcome to Take a Deep Breath. Today's interview is the author, Patrick McEwen, of the book, The Oxygen Advantage, a fantastic book. I highly recommend you read it. Uh, today, we talk in this podcast about COVID, how to prevent the spread, but also how to protect yourself. We go through the benefits of nasal breathing, and we also talk about things such as uh, Wim Hof versus the Oxygen Advantage. What are the differences and uh, you know how do each one play their role plus a load of other stuff you're going to get a lot of benefit from this podcast so i won't keep you waiting i'll just flash this up quickly and say if you haven't done so already please like subscribe and share and without any further ado let's get stuck into the podcast cheers <sighs> right good morning patrick and welcome to the take a deep breath podcast how are you doing sir Good, Mike. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. I'm looking forward to just getting stuck into this conversation with you. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast today. Um, I've gone out there and asked my audience for some questions as well. So there's a few bits uh, I'd like to get stuck into. But first of all, I think I just wanted to say a big thank you because some of the viewers might know or might not know, um, I recently took part in the uh, Oxygen uh, Advantage instructors course. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. Um, I learned so much about the science, so much about functional breathing, and I can't wait to have this masterclass with you today and just pick your brain on, on some more of that stuff. So Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Pleasure, Mike. Thanks very much for joining. No, really, really good. Uh, anybody that's interested in, in, in breathing and, and getting behind the scenes of it, so to speak, I would highly recommend the Oxygen Advantage book. Uh, and if you want to go even further than that, uh, the Instructors Program, because it is absolutely money well spent. And uh, yeah, so, so, so grateful. So Patrick, can you just first of all, tell me just a bit about you, your story and how you got into breathing? Sure. Um, I came across this back in 1998 just by sheer accident. And sometimes when you're looking for something and a solution can be around the corner without you expecting it. So I was a chronic mouth breather as a child with nasal obstruction, with asthma, and uh, I had sleep apnea even though it wasn't diagnosed. But I was told that as a teenager and also in university that I was stopping breathing during sleep. So, of course, I had no idea what it was, but I did know that I was constantly tired. And I was also breathing fast, hard, using the upper chest. So that would put me into a stress and fight or flight response. So the thing about breathing is that very little attention was paid on whether I was breathing through the nose or mouth. And I was a chronic mouth breather. You could hear my breathing during rest, eating meal times. You know, I wasn't able to chew food with my mouth closed because, of course, my nose was stuffed. So therefore, you're, you're chastised as having poor table manners. And of course, it's not the kid's fault because the kid is a stuffy nose and they don't have the facility to breathe through it. And the interesting thing about breathing, Mike, it never got any attention. I was going to doctors for many, many years. Um, I was in hospital a couple of times with asthma and nobody ever said to breathe through my nose despite having a lung condition and despite the fact that the mouth, it performs zero functions in terms of breathing. When you breathe in through your mouth, your mouth does absolutely nothing for the air that's coming into the body through the mouth. It only happens through the nose. So to make a long story short, I read in the newspaper about this work from a Russian doctor. He said two things. He said, breathe through your nose, but he also said, breathe light. And I was doing neither. So that kind of struck a chord with me. So I got the nose unblocking exercise and it worked temporarily. And I knew then there was something onto it because... How could you open up your nose by simply holding the breath? And that's what I was able to do. And then the more I breathed it through my nose, yeah, it was tough at the start because I was feeling suffocated because I had that habit of years and years of persistent, hard breathing and faster breathing. So when I first switched to nasal breathing, you do feel you're not getting enough air. And I kept with it. I did the exercise. I didn't have much information at the time, but I had enough. And that night, I taped my mouth and I also use breathe right strips across my nose so that my nose wouldn't totally stuff up. And it wouldn't anyway. But the first morning I woke up, yeah, I was kind of just getting used to it. Did it again the second night. Second morning I woke up, it was the best night's sleep I had in about 20 years. Then I knew. And my asthma symptoms reduced by 50% in one week. Wow. Now, I remember talking to the Asthma Society of Ireland about two to three years after that. And I explained, listen, there's something here with this method, the Buteco method. And I said the results were dr dramatic. And I'm talking about somebody that had asthma as a kid. And we have a huge instance of asthma in Ireland and the UK as well. Like it's about, it's nearly 10% of the population. And there's absolutely no mention. 
no mention by doctors, no mention by respiratory consultants, no mention by the asthma societies. They make no mention or no encouragement to breathe through the nose. And to be honest with you, I don't know why. But that's my story. So I was in the corporate world. I was working for a company called Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Um, I joined them after finishing, because my degree was in economics and in social sciences from Trinity College in Dublin. So when Enterprise Rent-A-Car was a multinational came to Dublin, I was one of the, there were three Irish employees taken on to help with their expansion in Ireland. I was one of those people. I absolutely hated the job. Absolutely hated it. Hated the control that the company had on individuals the pressurized targets and um, you're starting work at eight o'clock in the morning, but you mightn't finish until seven or eight o'clock that night, five days a week, you'd be on call Saturday, Sunday. I just felt that, you know, it was almost that it was, it, it was so orchestrated by, and I would say many employees are in the same position because there has to be something when I'm looking at burnout rates now in employees that corporations, you have MBAs at the top who are very intelligent individuals and are putting a program in place to absolutely milk employees, milk them. And yeah, there can be good companies as well, but there are some companies that are not that good. And it's also, it's almost deception. So between the, the jigs and the reels, I found something that worked really well for me. I hated my job. And when you combine the two together, it's a great recipe to get the hell out of it. So that's what I did. I retrained, changed my career, and it was a total gut feeling. I had a hunch that I had a feeling that I wanted to teach breathing and it was more so to people with asthma. I knew that it had helped me hugely. I knew that my energy levels were, were helped hugely. Um, there was nobody offering the service in Ireland at the time and very little of it internationally. So I trained in Russia, came back in 2002 and I focused everything on people with asthma, children with asthma. And then it was a few years later, I went into sleep, sleep disorder, breathing, sleep apnea and snoring. A few years later, in, in craniofacial development, anxiety, panic disorder, and then sports performance. And that's how the journey has evolved. You know, it's been amazing. It's really, really, I'm one of those lucky individuals that found a job that they absolutely love to do. And it's been absolutely tremendous because you can pick up a piece of research and you will happily read it in your spare time. You will happily stay stay you know abreast with everything that's going on with that field and if only more people could get a job that they love with a sense of purpose that they can apply yes i, I you know I, I i too kind of uh, resonate with that because uh, if you spoke to my friends and family they'd say i'm not that studious uh, but the fact i think a lot of people were shocked that i was spending hours a week uh, with yourself yeah doing the oxygen advantage, trying to understand the science behind it. Then I'm having separate coaching sessions with one of your instructors, uh, Gray. And uh, mm. so, you know, number of hours going on there each week and just learning and learning all about the science of it. And yeah. uh, I, I understand what you mean. It's, it's so fascinating. Um, and I too come from a corporate background. And um, you just reminded me of uh, when I'd come out of the Wim Hof retreat in around 2016, I went straight back into the office almost the next day. And I was in a meeting and I was so much more aware of my breathing. I was practicing the breathing in the morning, the exercises. And I remember I was in this particularly stressful meeting and I was so aware of my, my breath and it was so shallow and I was panting. Uh, and I, I've probably been doing that for years, but for the first time I was like, oh my God, wow, look at what stress is doing to me. I'm just suddenly in this fight or flight mode and I've probably been like that for such a long time. So the minute you become aware of the breath, yeah. You can really get down a rabbit hole there, can't you? Yeah, it's really amazing because your breath is your constant companion and your breathing is really susceptible to change with the environment and even your emotions, your thoughts. You know, when you look at individuals who are more susceptible to breathing pattern disorders, people with perfectionist tendencies, um, hormones change breathing, excessive talking changes breathing, the belief it's good to take big breaths, um, genetics, you know, is influencing breathing patterns. And really, when we come down to the breath, you, of course, when you came from the Wim Hof retreat, you had an awareness of your breathing that you were in tune in your, with your breathing. And I think most people are not aware of their breath because, of course, it's involuntary. And they probably don't give it any attention unless it's not kind of working up to par. But this is a great way to determine stress in the body by continuously bring your attention out of the mind into the body feel your breathing, feel the body. And it's a great way to help deal with stress because you pick up on it quick. And once you start noticing then that your breathing is getting that bit faster and harder, 
you can do something by slowing it down, not by taking the big deep breath that people normally tell you to take, but by doing the opposite to initiate a parasympathetic response. And I think a lot of people are stuck in sympathetic tone. They are stuck in that fight or flight. And I really feel for the next generation, the, the youngsters now who are on mobile phones and smartphones are stuck looking into a phone. And again, corporations that are really consuming so much of their time and playing with their heads because they have very intelligent psychologists coming in, behavioral analysts, to make children and teenagers and adults addicted to the technology. And really, where is this going? Because, you know, the, the time that's consumed and the greed of corporations, because, of course, all they are interested in is their share price. If you spend a lot of time on their platforms, it's good for the company in terms of advertising revenue. And it's very sinister. It's very sinister. But the side effect of it is going to be a lot of increased anxiety in time to come. So breathing, um, what you spoke about is it's going to be the, it's going to be the almost uh, the kind of the, you know, something that people can resort to. It's the antidote to what's going on at the moment in terms of technology. Yes, yes. And it's free as well, which is the most beautiful yeah. part, part about it. Um, so I started uh, taping up last week at night, yeah. so just, a, just, a, just a little bit here. And, and I have to say, before I did this, I was 100% convinced I did not mouth breathe at night. I would have put my life savings on it, you know, everything yeah. I own. Um, and I taped up and I thought, I'm probably going to be fine the next morning, no different. I didn't go, I'm probably sharing too much yet, I didn't go for a wee in the night, which I mm. always do. And I woke up with moisture in my mouth for the first mm. time. I was like, oh, I, I always have a glass of water next to the bed. Um, so, so that only started last week. And I, as I said, I was completely convinced it wouldn't do anything for me. I was like, I don't, I don't mouth breathe at night. So what is going on there? What, what, why are we mouth breathing in the evenings? And why is the tape helpful for that? You know, it's, it's, it's really difficult to pinpoint exactly why we mouth breathe. And it's very common with kids as well, 25 to 50% of young kids. It didn't happen with our ancestors. So it's obviously something that we are doing now that our ancestors didn't do. Mm -hmm. Some of the reasons, probably due to the food that we are eating, it's totally soft, um, that we're not eating hard food. That's, you know, it's, it's about the food that we would have eaten, eaten, our ancestors would have eaten that food would have developed the muscles of the jaws and the face to help maintain nasal posture, nasal breathing posture, but closed mouth posture. Breastfeeding can play a role there because of course it's not just about nutrition, it's also about manipulation of the muscles necessary for craniofacial growth. Um, there's other reasons, but you know, it's like I was the same and it's very common for people to have nasal issues or a small nose it's very common for breathing pattern disorders. If you look at it, the anxiety and panic disorder population, it's as high as 80%, 80%. And all of those things will culminate in feeling that when you switch to nasal breathing, you don't get enough air. Now, during sleep, of course, the muscles are relaxed and there is a tendency for the jaw to hang down. Um, and it doesn't happen with everybody. If people have really well-developed jaw structures, they tend to be nasal breathers. But it happens more as we get older. So obviously the muscles that are playing a role there, they don't work as effectively as we get older. When we are over 40 years of age, we are six times more likely to spend at least 50% of our sleep time breathing through an open mouth. Now the risk here is then snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Because if you have your mouth open, your tongue is in a resting or a low resting posture in the mouth. Your tongue is encroaching the airway. So your airway, which is the, you know, the pipe at the, back, at the back of the mouth, at the back of the nose, that's getting narrower. This is increasing a resistance to breathing. This in turn can contribute to collapse of the airway. You stop breathing during sleep or you have a partial collapse. Your blood oxygen levels are affected. You're partially woken up from sleep. You're waking up feeling exhausted. As you mentioned, a greater need to go to the bathroom during the night. Um, dental health. You know, if you have six or eight hours of your mouth open, that your mouth is dry, You've, you've lost a lot of moisture, bacteria is more rampant, greater gum disease, greater bad breath, dental cavities. I, you know, what I'd say mouth breathing is absolutely trauma because I think throughout our evolution, the only time that our ancestors switched to mouth breathing was really in times of fight or flight, in huge stress. If they were hunting for an animal, they were actually maintaining nasal breathing. Um, Edmund Davis, an anthropologist, I wrote him about him in the book, that he was tracking the primitive groups and he used to go for runs with them. And they would run after an animal 
And, you know, they would continuously track an animal until the animal died from exhaustion. And pretty much he, the thing he observed were that they maintain nasal breathing all the way through. And it makes sense because if you can imagine our ancestors in a hot environment, if they went hunting, they weren't guaranteed water. So the only way to conserve water to make sure that they didn't dehydrate was their ability to nasal breathe because the nose is moistening and warming and filtering and regulating breathing volume on the way it leaves the body. The nose is helping to recover the heat and moisture from the exhale breath because the body has expended an energy in, in conditioning that air as it's brought into the nose and the body is recovering that energy on the way out. So there's a 42% greater water loss breathing out through the mouth. So all of those issues from a dental health point of view and, you know, again, breathing again, like breathing, even though your dentist mightn't have said anything about that, some do, some really, really get this. There are some of the best orthodontists that I've met are so clued in. Dr. William Hang from uh, California, um, Dr. James Bronson, and there are many others, you know, that are really, really clued in. And they're driving this home in terms of getting children to breathe through the nose. One of the best orthodontists in the world, Professor John Mew from the UK, his son, Dr. Mike Mew. And I remember going over them and, to them in 2010. And I sat in their chairs and they allowed me to sit in the clinic on chairs while they were working with their patients. Of course, patient consent. I was writing a book at the time. I was bringing the two aspects together. Buteco meets Dr. Mew was the name of the book. I was fascinated by the, the drive that they had to really ensure that children, when they were doing orthodontic treatment, that children weren't mouth breathing because it's not just about straightening the teeth. It's about development of the face. And it's about development of the face that there's forward growth in the face to maximize airway size. If you look at people who were attractive, you will tend to see a couple of things. Their maxilla is well forward in the face. It's not like mine. Mine is set back because of mouth breathing. Their mandible is well forward in the face. They have really beautiful forward growth of the face. They've got a wide facial structure. When they smile, you don't see black triangles either side of the teeth. They don't have a long, narrow face because a long, narrow face is conducive to mouth breathing. Um, is it mouth breathing that causes the long, narrow face or is it the long, narrow face that causes mouth breathing? There is a feedback loop there. But coming back to Professor Mew, he's been talking about this for 50 years and his colleagues were criticizing him. And now he's proving to be right. So he has, you know, he, eventually I think there's a greater awareness now. And when you see the book by the likes of um, James Nestor, his book on Brett, and he's exploring this topic and he too met, met Dr. Mew. Like this is fascinating stuff, but sometimes, and the only reason I say it, Mike, is people ask me the question, well, show me the science. There's very little science in this because doctors don't want to research breathing. It's not a topic that's that sexy. It's not a topic that's going to get, give you kudos. You know, you're not going to be this whole innovation. You know, it's, it's just one of those topics that just doesn't, it doesn't get the awareness. It's because probably because it's so simple. But this is where it's at because I think that, number one, the medical establishment have absolute, absolutely let down people by not encouraging nasal breathing. The dental industry in the main has been asleep on this issue because they were in such a great position. Dental health is impacted by virtue if you have your mouth open or closed. I was a mouth breather. I, have so many, I had so many dental cavities. That wasn't as a result of eating sweets. That was as a result of not having the natural defense in my mouth to counteract the bacteria because my mouth was dry. And the trauma to the airways. And there's tens of thousands of children throughout the UK, throughout the world that are in the same boat. They're exhausted. They can't concentrate. They are graded academically on what they are achieving in grades. It's not about their intelligence. The kids are too tired. I was too tired. You know, in primary school, I was one of the top of the class. When I left primary school at 11 years of age to go into secondary school, I went from the top of the class down towards the bottom of the class. And the one thing, and I remember school teachers, they would admonish you because you didn't have the, intel you didn't have the facility to concentrate. 
you didn't have the attention to place it on the curriculum. And of course, then you get frustrated as a kid because, you know, we're expecting children to sit down for six or eight hours a day. Number one is we are not teaching them how to concentrate. Number two is we are teaching them how to think. That's what education is doing. But it's not teaching children how to stop thinking. It's not teaching and giving them the ability to, to, to be able to control their own mind in terms of to be aware of the thought processes that are going on in the head. And this is really so important because most people are living life absolutely stuck in their head. Once they develop the reasoning facility at three, four, five years of age, they are stuck in their head, immersed in thought, asleep to life. You cannot connect with life if you're living in your head. I spent 20 years too living in my head. And that's one of the things about the breath. Because when you have your attention out of the mind on your breathing, not just thinking about your breathing, but connecting with the inhalation, connecting with the exhalation, gently slowing it down. And what you can do to your body, to the functioning of the automatic, the automatic functioning of your body by changing your breathing is amazing. You know, and really that's where, like health should be embracing breathing. Sleep up until 15 years ago wasn't getting any attention. Now obstructive sleep apnea is well on the radar, still probably not on the radar for many doctors, um, but it's getting there. Breathing is going to be the next, the next real debate here, and yes. it's, it's, it's time. Yeah. What, what do you think is causing this, this surge of, of breathing? I watched a podcast you did a little while ago where you said that I think you'd, you'd put that COVID video out there and, mm. and you'd seen a lot more people come forward for your, your classes and, and more views. What, what, yeah. what do you think is driving this, this surge? In well, at this, at this time, COVID has really put an awareness on breathing because it's a respiratory disease and, you know, or at least it's, it's transmitted, you know, partly res respiratory um, it affects the lungs. It affects your blood oxygen saturation. It gives you symptoms for, very much in terms of respiratory shortness of breath, air hunger, etc. And here's the strange thing. The World Health Organization are talking about washing hands. They're not talking about nasal breathing, both for the individual who doesn't want to get infected. Like I was in tubes in London, right, traveling right up until March the 17th is when I flew back from Los Angeles back to Ireland. And that was locked down on the 18th. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember being in tubes and I was just thinking here, this was rush hour in London, five o'clock in the evening. They were absolutely crowded. And I did two things there. I says, there could be people infected in this carriage. And I'm going to do two things because I want to reduce the viral load that's coming into my body. I kept my mouth shut and I breathed hardly any air for the entire duration of the journey. I had air hunger all the way through. Keeps you very calm. And air hunger, by the way, is, as you know, Mike, but just for your listeners, it signifies that carbon dioxide is increased in the blood. And this is helping to open up blood vessels. It increases oxygen delivery from the, from the hemoglobin to the tissues. So in terms of COVID, why have the World Health Organization, why have they not talked about nasal breathing to help to reduce the risk of infection and also for those people who are infected? Because as I said, your nose recovers the moisture from the exhale breath. There's a 42% greater water loss breathing out through your mouth. If you're breathing hard and fast with your mouth open, you are emitting a greater volume of water particles into the atmosphere, like an aerosol, and this is how it's being transmitted. You know, there's a Zumba class in Korea, and you'll see it online. This, in fact, this is, um, Zumba dance instructor went in. She gave, she gave a class. And every, she was infected, the dance instructor. And of course, she's moving, she's breathing hard, she's mouth breathing, and she literally infected. Everybody in the class got infected as a result of it. Now, gyms really have to change their stance in terms of mouth breathing. Yes. In a gym, you have to breathe through your nose, you have to breathe, and there's a way to breathe. And it, it just, like, it doesn't make sense anyway for people to do exercise with their mouth open. And we'll probably go through that later. But I think, you know, I've noticed since 2002, since 2000, from 2002 to 2014, 2015, it was very organic growth. It was just happening a little bit here and a little bit there. And like, yeah, it was great because, of course, it was happening, but it was so slow and so gentle. And from 2015, it's just taken off. And 
I mean to take an off that the volume of my work before the cancellation of travel, I was booked out a year and a half in advance. I couldn't do, I was, it was crazy to be honest with you. It went from one, ex, one extreme to another, you know, and um, wh why is that happening? I think there's a number of reasons. I think probably it's culminating that, you know, religion for people, maybe this may be one reason. Religion was traditionally a source of comfort for people, institutionalized religion. I can talk about Ireland, for example, with Catholicism. And because of what was happening in the Catholic Church here in Ireland, and a lot of people have moved away from the traditional hierarchies. You know, youngsters, people under 40 years of age, they don't tend to go to church. If you went down to your local church, most people are probably 50 years of age plus. But there's a void there. We as human beings, we need to be able to take solace in terms of quieting the mind. And for the older generations, prayer would have done that, or a mantra would have done that. And it's funny, when you look at the cadence of breathing that's practiced during the practice of the rosary, the cadence of breathing is 5.5 and 6 breaths per minute. It's the same cadence of breathing that's happening during some mantras that have originated from Tibet. And 5.5 to 6 breaths per minute is the optimal breathing rate to influence the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. So I think the demise, if I use that word, or at least uh, the, you know, the reluctancy of people to go to church is one aspect, that there's a void there and that breathing may be helping to fulfill that void. There's no doubt that the Wim Hof, Wim Hof has been absolutely instrumental in creating a wave of awareness of breathing and the power of the breath to do what he was doing. And he's got the personality as well. He's extrovert, he's outgoing. You know, he's, 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 he's got a personality that is very much Western personality in terms of he can get attention. Whereas people who normally work in breathing can be introvert. I'm an introvert um, because I bring my attention inward. So, so I'm not the one to kind of go around a room, for example, I'll hide, I'll stay in the, the sides or whatever. I talk to one or two people. Um, and you sometimes need an extrovert and you need somebody to be able to really make themselves public to make a change in the stance of thinking. And he's done it by achieving many world records. He's performed many feats in terms of um, immersion, immersion in cold for considerable lengths of time. And he's done it through the power of the breath. So he's got a great message to put out there. And he has certainly brought attention to breathing. Um, and the effect of breathing that when you do the Wim Hof technique, it's a stressor. It's causing, causing adaptations to the body. Pro-inflammatory pro cytokines are reducing and anti-inflammatory um, cells are increasing. So, you know, you can influence through activating the sympathetic state. You can help to influence the, the immune system that individuals, and this could be possible, this does need more research. But, you know, Cox's paper came out in 2014, and I haven't seen too many papers since, even though Wim Hof has got hundreds of thousands of followers. There are very, this should be researched until this is crying out for more research, because nothing gets embraced in medicine until you have 500 papers on PubMed. It took us, it took us 20 years to get 20 papers on asthma using the Buteco method. And the papers, the studies were all very positive. Yeah, okay, some, some trials could be criticized a little bit here and a little bit there. And it's very difficult to get a perfect trial, to get a double blinded randomized control trial. Um, and it's expensive. And breathing instructors, we don't tend to be, we are, we are not millionaires, you know, we are like, we, people who teach breathing, we, are, we get an income from it. Um, it's not like a company that's a pharmaceutical company who can put a lot of money to research. So there is really, the research is lagging. And then people are saying, well, if it was so good, and this has been, people have said this to me, you know, if it's so good, why is there not more papers on it? And I can't answer that. But if you look at Wim Hof, he doesn't have, with what he has put out into the world, there is limited research on it, you know, and I know there are a couple of papers on it. Is there 10 papers on the Wim Hof technique in total? I don't think so, but I could be wrong there. It could be. Um, but my point there is that's not a criticism of the Wim Hof method. That's a criticism on the, I will say the universities, the powerhouses that are getting paid to conduct research to the advancement of the human potential. 
and they are not embracing it because they're probably stuck in their own little silos, their vested interests there. There's funding and sponsorship grants coming in, but somebody is definitely pulling the strings. And it money talks, you know, and breathing is not one of those things that are going to generate the volumes of income that are going to sponsor and lead to massive amount of evidence here. But in saying that, it's not that breathing doesn't work. It's just that the science hasn't caught up with it. And always, we always have to put that out there. People talk to me about where's the science with the nose versus the mouth. Listen, it's logical to breathe through your nose. No animal goes around with their mouth hanging open except for a dog. You never see an animal in the wild breathing hard or you never see them mouth breathing because innately they have an intelligence there that they are breathing at a rate and a volume conducive to their metabolic needs. It's the human that ideas have changed. And, you know, like logic and common sense sometimes has to prevail here. More and more people are paying attention to it. It's getting more exposure. Uh, you know, millions of people are watching breathwork videos all over the internet and taking part in courses and, and books are coming out on it. So I, I think it's such an exciting time to be riding yes. that curve. It's, um, it's amazing. My question, and I know you've had this question many times, mm. uh, and there's a fantastic video uh, on London Real about Wim Hof versus Oxygen Advantage. Yeah. Would you mind for my viewers, just give me a little overview on kind of the key differences between the two. Yeah, sure. The, the Oxygen Advantage, I, I put an emphasis on functional breathing training just as, as much as I do on stressors. Um, so in terms of we have breathing exercises to downregulate, to bring people from a sympathetic tone into a parasympathetic tone, I want to know how is the person breathing during rest, during sleep, during physical exercise. I'm not just concerned about how are they breathing when they're inside the studio. More important is how are they breathing outside of the studio? Because you can influence the autonomic nervous system. Just even looking at functional breathing, we need to look at it from a perspective of three, three dimensions. The biochemistry, the biomechanics, and the cadence of the breath. And every time that we look at breathing, I always will look at it from those three dimensions. A breathing technique, what's it doing to the biochemistry? Is it increasing CO2? Is it, is it reducing CO2 in the blood? Or is it keeping the same? The biomechanics, is it helping to improve breathing low, using later, having lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs? Cadence of the breath, is the breath being slowed down sufficiently down to 5.5 and 6 breaths per minute to stimulate the vagus nerve to increase the sensitivity of the bioreceptors? So functional breathing is tremendous because this is where we can too make subtle adaptations conducive to improving health because people who are not well, either emotionally or physically, they have poor heart rate variability and we can help improve heart rate variability, which is a measure of vagal tone by changing their functional breathing patterns. Now, on the other hand, with oxygen advantage, we do breath holding, but I don't do the hyperventilating before the breath holds. So we have a normal breath in, a normal breath out, we hold the nose, hold the breath, and then we will combine it with physical exercise. The purpose is to drop blood oxygen saturation and to increase carbon dioxide. And the combined effect here of the hypoxic hypercapnic stimulus is to disturb the blood acid base balance, to force the body to make adaptations, to include, to improve buffering capacity, probably inside the muscle compartment. But also we get spleen contraction, we're reducing the, the sensitivity towards carbon dioxide, increasing blood flow, open up airways, etc. So that's oxygen advantage, functional breathing and a stressor. Wim Hof technique, of course, is you've got the cold, um, which is excellent in terms of, you know, putting the human body into a sense of discomfort to, again, force the body to be more resilient, if I use that word. And then with the breathing technique, it's also a stressor. The hyperventilation, the 30 breaths at the start of it, it will get rid of a lot of carbon dioxide um, from normal of 40 millimeters of mercury down to, I can't remember what exactly it is. And funny enough, I was only looking at the, the paper last night, but the first cycle of hyperventilation does get rid of a lot of carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. This creates a state of, this increases blood pH. After the hyperventilation, because there is such a depletion of carbon dioxide, the individual can hold their breath for so long because carbon dioxide is the alarm to breathe. And if you get rid of the alarm to breathe, 
well, you have to wait for carbon dioxide to accumulate in the blood before it triggers the point whereby the brain sends the stimulus to breathe. So if you hyperventilate and then do a breath hold, it's natural that you'll hold your breath for so much longer because the alarm to breathe is being depleted. And as you're able to hold your breath for so much longer, your blood oxygen saturations can go much lower. So with the Wim Hof technique, they achieve a greater drop to blood oxygen saturation than what we do. And their first cycle, it drops it down to 85%. That's what I want to do. That's our goal throughout all of our cycles. But with the Wim Hof technique after the breath hold, the carbon dioxide that has been reduced, and I can only refer to Cox's paper because it's the only science that I can find. There could be more papers out there that the carbon dioxide from, they'll drop the carbon dioxide during the hyperventilation. It doesn't recover during the breath hold. And that's why I would put my, uh, my stance on it would be that the Wim Hof technique, as according to Cox's paper, is hypoxic, hypocapnic, low O2, low CO2. Now it's the combined effect of that, that's stressing the body, that you have an increase in epinephrine, you have an increase of adrenaline, and this in turn, then the sympathetic activation that you're putting the body into such a stress state, almost that you're shaking the body to wake up the body, that the immune system then is forced to, would it be to reset or to refocus or to target. And the interesting thing that the researchers from Matthias Cox wrote, he says there are medications on the market for irritable bowel syndrome, for rheumatoid arthritis. And I have met individuals with rheumatoid arthritis who have been able to come off their medication as a result of doing the Wim Hof technique. Now that's anecdotal, but if you look at the, and it's not to say that it's not happening. The only reason I'm saying it's anecdotal is these, and I would totally um, believe the people who told me about it and because they were able to give me a description of the, the drugs that they were on. I think it was a mirror. They were able to give me a description of the side effects, the history, and these were young individuals who would have been on a life of this medication for the rest of their life until they came across the Wim Hof technique. The issue with these medications are number one is they are very costly. And number two is that they have significant side effects, significant. Now, these medications are stressing the body or if I may not be using the words correctly, but they are in a similar way, almost that they are antagonizing the immune system to be better able to cope or to reduce, to fight the inflammation. So that's the, the point that Cox made. Now, could you have a breathing technique that is literally free once you learn it, that can offer this prospect, this potential for many people with serious medical conditions, including rheumatoid arthritis? And it just doesn't make sense that we are not putting more research into it, you know, on the basis of that. And so in, to make a comparison, I think the Wim Hof technique and the oxygen advantage actually have good similarities, but it's the breath tolling. We don't do the hyperventilation. Um, we do breath tolling. We do breath tolling also on the exhalation. And then we look at functional breathing patterns as well. Now, the result, you could ask the question then, does the Wim Hof technique increase or decrease oxygen delivery to the tissues? And that's an interesting one. From the oxygen advantage point of view, when you do a breath hold, carbon dioxide is intact. And during that breath hold, carbon dioxide is increasing and it will cause vasodilation. So for example, we can improve blood flow to the brain despite holding the breath. But if you hyperventilate us during the Wim Hof technique, You've blown off a lot of carbon dioxide. Even during the, the breath hold, carbon dioxide is not fully recovering. What effect is this having on blood flow? Probably, is it causing vasodilation? Not likely when CO2 is not recovering back to baseline. The second aspect is if you hyperventilate, you don't increase the blood oxygen saturation because normally with normal breathing, we are already almost fully saturated, 95 to 99%. Now, if you, for example, have an individual and their pulse oximetry, which is a little finger probe you put on your finger, and it's measuring the fraction of your hemoglobin, your red blood, your red blood cells occupied by, by oxygen. If you have, say, a blood oxygen saturation, an SpO2 of 97%, if you hyperventilate and you get rid of carbon dioxide, your blood oxygen saturation will actually increase. And the reason being is because the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen has become stronger. 
and hemoglobin isn't releasing the oxygen so readily to the tissues. So what hyperventilation does in the depletion of carbon dioxide is that less oxygen actually gets delivered to the tissues. So on one hand, during the Wim Hof technique, you're going to have a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve as a result of the loss of carbon dioxide and the drop to blood pH. But on the other hand, the hyperventilation is going to increase the oxygen dissolved in the plasma. So there is a small amount of oxygen carried directly in the blood. So here, on one hand, you have a net loss of oxygen delivery. And on the other hand, you have a, you have a plus. So what's the overall effect? I don't know. And that's the interesting thing about it, you know. <laughs> and this is the thing about breathing. And, you know, like sometimes there's more and more as new things are unearthed. Like, for example, nitric oxide, that gas, that was only discovered on the exhale breath of the human being back in 1991. And of course, that's going to change the dynamic and the, the theories behind what can be happening when people are doing breathing exercises. Yes. And just as I make that point, you know, if you Google, Mike, COVID-19, nitric oxide clinical trials, you will see that there are clinical trials underway for, for nitric oxide as a treatment of COVID-19. The nose is also a potent source of nitric oxide in the upper airways. The mouth isn't. And when you breathe through your nose, you're carrying nitric oxide laden air into your lungs. And nitric oxide is a bronchodilator. It helps open up the airways. It's a vasodilator. It helps open up the blood vessels in the lungs. It helps to redistribute the blood throughout the lungs. It increases oxygen uptake in the blood. When I talk about that, that's the PO2 by 10% by virtue of nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. Nitric oxide is sterilizing the incoming air. And in 2005, with SARS coronavirus, in a laboratory petri dish, dish, in terms of nitric oxide, when it was, when when coronavirus was exposed to nitric oxide, nitric oxide prevented the replication, the cycle of coronavirus. Now you know this again comes back to nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. Breathe through your nose, breathe slow, and also if you want to hum. And again, many ancient groups they knew and they practiced humming. They may not know what, what it was doing. Of course, now we know that one of the benefits of humming is that you vibrate the nasal cavity, you're vibrating the sinuses. So nitric oxide then is released from the sinuses into the nasal cavity. And the nitric oxide concentration in the upper airways can increase 15-fold and even as high as 20-fold by virtue of humming. So you're humming, so you take your breath in through the nose and you're humming a long and prolonged exhalation. And then the next breath, breathe in through your nose so that you're capturing that NO, bringing it into the lungs, where it can do its marvelous work in the lungs. Again, why are people with respiratory conditions not encouraged to nasal breathe? And here is why I say it, because I had a life of 20 years of mouth breathing. If you have a respiratory condition, you don't just have a problem with your lungs. You also are more likely to have a problem with your nose. Because... It's not that the nose and the throat and the lungs, they are not separate airways. It's one airway. Since 2007, researchers have identified it as a unified airway. Whatever happens in the lungs, if there is inflammation there, it can travel up to the nose. And if there's inflammation of the nose, it can travel down to the lungs. If you have a stuffy nose, you are 1.8 times more likely to have a sleep problem. And people who are anxious are more likely to have nasal congestion. It's all of the bi-directional feedback and relationships throughout the human body. We cannot just look at the human body as being split up into separate components because each of those components are influencing each other. Yes. Oh, there's so many bits that I want to unpack. <laughs> when it comes sure. to the, hu the humming, um, I was thinking, when you're humming out, are you losing some of that lovely nitric oxide? And should we be trying to hum inwards, if that's even possible, so that the vibrations <laughs> happen and you're absorbing it? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, you would, you would think that on the exhalation, it's because it's so prolonged and slow that obviously that we're not breathing out as much nitric oxide as we, is being released from the sinuses. So yeah, it's a good question. If you, if you look at the clinical papers, and they don't really describe as to how it's being done. So, you know, we've been trying to get our way. Well, how do they do it to, to increase nitric oxide so much? Mm. Could you hum on the inhalation? 
That I don't know. <laughs> Good question. I, I almost feel like somebody's going to invent something, some sort of uh, uh, frequency that's given the brain a bit of a shake to, to release it. I don't know. I can picture something like that. But uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I will practice some uh, some <laughs> inhalation humming. Um, so, so this mouth breathing, nose breathing thing, then, if you were to look at a list of benefits of nose breathing, it's mm. just ridiculous. And the more you start to learn, you almost want to grab people and string, go, stop breathing through your mouth. And yeah. just all those. And the analogy I've got, which I don't know if it's a great one is it's almost like drinking dirty water. You know, it's a good time in there with the bottle. Mm. It's almost like you're drinking dirty water from a puddle when you're mouth breathing. And when you're drinking uh, this lovely, clean, filtered mountain water, that's pure and lovely and got no dirt in it. And that's the nose breathing to me. And we should be going for that lovely water versus that dirty puddle water. And all we need to do there is just shut the mouth. Is that a good yeah. analogy? Do you think is there more to it than that? I think there's more. It's not just about the quality of the air that we're taking in in terms of the filtration. Um, like if you, if you were to contact any sports university whereby they have undergraduates in sports science, I would love to know, is there any mention of nasal breathing in the, any of the curriculums there? And this again can be puzzling because there's been very few papers on, the Bennett, on investigating nasal breathing versus mouth breathing in sports, but one professor has been looking at it George Dallum, who we speak about in the Oxygen Advantage. He was a very well-known triathlete in the United States, and he switched to nasal breathing about six years ago. He found it, he found it, it made quite a significant difference to his runs, and then in 2018, he put it to the test. He got 10 recreational athletes, and his study was interesting because he said, listen, he says, the 10 of you, I want you to breathe exclusively through your nose for six months while doing all of your physical exercise. And then we will test you. We will test you after the adaptations have taken place. And then we will check, is there a difference nasal breathing versus mouth breathing? Now, when you break down what he uncovered there, number one is it didn't matter where the, whether the individuals breathed through the nose or mouth in terms of reaching 100% of maximum intensity. Even with nasal breathing, they were able to achieve it. But nasal breathing had 39 breaths per minute and mouth breathing was 49 breaths. Nasal breathing, the CO2 in the blood was 44 millimeters of mercury. With mouth breathing, it was 40. Nasal breathing, the fraction of expired oxygen was less. In other words, that the body had utilized the oxygen more efficiently. And what, you know, there's no point in bringing in oxygen and breathing it back out. You know, We want to bring in oxygen and get that oxygen delivered two working muscles. And a catalyst for that is carbon dioxide. And again, it comes back to people talk about carbon dioxide being a waste gas. And of course, they don't realize the functions of CO2. If they understood the functions of carbon dioxide in the human body, they would definitely not cause it, call it a waste gas. Because in order for oxygen to be released from the red blood cells to tissues and organs, it's dependent on the presence of carbon dioxide and resultant pH. But back to Dallam's paper, Individuals had 22% less ventilation, 22% less breathing, 22% less breathlessness. There's an economical saving there. Now, with physical exercise, in very brief, you breathe through your nose, it protects your airways. You're less likely to have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. That can affect up to 50%, depending on whatever paper, of the athlete population. You don't have to have asthma to have exercise induced bronchoconstriction. Number two, nasal breathing is conservation of moisture in the body, so you're less likely to be dehydrated. Number three, nasal breathing during physical exercise, you've got better mental, sorry, you've got better dental health because of course, runners can also be prone to dental cavities and gum disease because they spend a lot of time with dry mouths. Number four, Dr. John Dullier, back in 1991, published a paper that when individuals breathed through their nose during physical exercise, they were in flow state. Mouth breathing, conversely, you were in a fight or flight or more likely to be in that sympathetic, um, different state of mind than nasal breathing. Number five, nasal breathing is harnessing nasal nitric oxide. This, in turn, is helping to redistribute the blood throughout the lungs to increase oxygen uptake in the blood. Nasal breathing is increasing carbon dioxide in the blood during physical exercise. So the oxygen that's in the blood gets better distributed throughout the body, the working muscles. You stay aerobically for longer. I can't remember what number I'm on now, but I'm going to make a couple of more points. Your nose is directly connected with the lower regions of the lungs. Like I often say to students coming into me, 
look at your chest and take a breath through the mouth. When you breathe through your mouth, what part of the body is moving? Mouth breathing is typically fast and shallow breathing. Nose breathing is typically low breathing. Low breathing is that you are, you are effectively using your diaphragm, which is, now of course, with all breathing you use your diaphragm, but the, the question to ask is, how much are you using the diaphragm? Are you getting lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs? You know, we have to think of the core as a box with the diaphragm at the top, the pelvic floor at the bottom, the abdominals to the front, and the spinal muscles to the back. And the diaphragm plays a role with other muscles in the generation of intra-abdominal pressure. So just as a weightlifter, they breathe in, they hold their breath to brace their abdomen so that it provides a pneumatic support for stabilization of the spine. If we have dysfunctional breathing, we have dysfunctional movement. Nose breathing is the first step to achieving functional breathing. And if we have functional breathing, we are more likely to have functional movement and a reduced risk of injury. So for athletes, it absolutely does not make any sense to have all of their time with the mouth open. Um, I would say to people, start switching to nasal breathing during your physical exercise. At, this, at the beginning, it's a bit tougher because the air hunger is just a little bit more challenging. But in about six to eight weeks, that air hunger diminishes and you will be able to sustain and better recovery, less trauma on the body and a better workout by virtue of just changing the habit, using your nose because that's what nature has intended it to be used for, breathing. Fantastic. Patrick, we're coming towards the end now, so just a couple of last quick questions for you, because I know we've got to finish and uh, wrap up on the hour. Um, if, you, if somebody comes up to you and says, what are the key things I need to do to improve my health? And we, we say nasal breathing is already a, a given. What other things might you say based on the research you've seen that you give advice to people to do? I think there's two aspects that have been probably overlooked a little bit too much. One is the biochemistry in breathing. And what I would say to people is, you know, practice when you're sitting down. And even just put one hand on your chest, one hand just above your navel, and gently start slowing down the speed of your breathing so that you're really slowing down the speed of the air coming into your nose. And at the top of the breath, bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body and have a relaxed and gentle breath out. Slow down your breathing sufficiently to the point of air hunger. And air hunger signifies that carbon dioxide is increased in the blood. Check the effect that that has on your saliva in the mouth. Check the effect it has on the temperature of your hands. In other words, when you practice breathing light, breathing slow and gentle, and under breathing a little bit, not by tensing up or not by getting into stress, just by gently slowing down your breath, you can influence the 70,000 miles of blood vessels in the body. But you can also influence, due to the Bohr effect, which was discovered back in 1904, you can, get, you can increase oxygen delivery throughout the body. I would say to people to practice that because it's kind of ironic, Mike. We have a belief in the Western world that the harder we breathe, the more oxygen that's delivered throughout the body. If you breathe too hard every day, and all you have to be doing is breathing a little bit faster, a little bit harder, a little bit up in the upper chest, your blood vessels are constricting and there's less oxygen delivered throughout the body. It's very common for people with dysfunctional breathing patterns to have cold hands, to have cold feet, and to have brain fog. And you can simply influence that by switching and breathing a little bit less. And if you do that in practice then, that becomes your habitual way to breathe. The second aspect is look at the research of slow breathing and what it can do to the autonomic nervous system. Individuals with irritable bowel syndrome fibromyalgia, COPD, asthma, hypertension, hypotension, anxiety, depression, um, and a host of other different conditions are showing reduced heart rate variability. That the time in between beats, the or to or intervals, are not as random as they should be. But you can influence the automatic functioning of your body to help these conditions by simply changing your breathing just for periods of time throughout the day. You sit down, you turn off your phone, you bring your attention inwards, even just gently breathing in for a count of five seconds, breathing out for a count of five seconds, breathing in for a count of five seconds, breathing out for a count of five seconds. In other words, you're changing the respiratory rate 
down to six breaths per minute to influence the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. This is a tremendous means that you can tap into influence bodily systems disturbed by stress. As Dr. Herbert Benson said, stress makes people sick. And on the basis that stress makes people sick, relaxation makes them better. Relaxation through the breath. Don't live with your life stuck in your head, asleep in thought. Society isn't talking about it enough. This should be taught in schools. We should be, have the means of being able to take our attention out of the head and relate to everything around us. And one way to start on that journey is focus on your breath. You bring a quietness to the mind. You bring a stillness to the mind. You increase concentration. You increase focus. You increase intuition. You're creating space in the mind for original and fresh thinking. It will help you in many facets of your life. Your breath is your friend. Connect with it. Oh, fantastic. Let, let's leave that there. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, how Thank can people find your work online? Where, where should they be looking? We have, even despite all my giving out about social media, I had to be dragged kicking and screaming into social media as well. So we have Instagram, Oxygen Advantage, and we have videos up on YouTube. And also we have our website, oxygenadvantage.com. Fantastic. And Patrick has a fantastic podcast as well on the Oxygen Advantage uh, channel on YouTube. So please check that out. Uh, if you haven't read his book already, uh, highly recommend it. Uh, I'll put the link in the description below so you can pick it up on Amazon. Fantastic read. Um, Patrick, thank you so much. Guys, thank you for watching. Uh, a fantastic podcast, uh, fantastic interview. Thank you. And uh, if you haven't done so already, the classic of please subscribe below, please give us a like, put a comment in if there's something you'd like to see uh, in the next video as well. Uh, and we'll see you next week. Thanks everybody, take care.